Look, I don't know how many times we've been over this, okay? I didn't kill your character, the Dragoloss killed your character. And it's not my fault that the rest of the party doesn't like you enough to try to bring your character back to life. Well, maybe you should have considered that before you started stealing items from the rest of their inventory by making sleight of hand rolls against the party. Yeah, well, look, I don't have time to talk about this right now, I have to go, okay? Jeez! How's it going, everybody? Welcome to a brand new campaign diary. My phone might be broken, but until I look down there, I'm not gonna be mad about it. Man, that was a close one. Anyways. Hello, and welcome to a brand new campaign diary. I am your host, Josiah, also known as Dungeon Dad, and it has been a while since we made one of these videos. If you are new to the channel or you haven't watched any of my previous campaign diaries, I would recommend you check those out first because you're probably not going to know too much of what's going on. But if you just kind of want to see where my game is at, whether you've seen the other ones or not, hopefully you can find this interesting or helpful or... Apparently some of you guys out there do actually enjoy these videos because I often get them requested on Twitter and Discord or wherever. And I do like making them, so the only reason there hasn't been one up until now is because, as many of you know, my real life schedule with work and everything has been super busy, which not only has slowed down my time for producing videos, but it's also made it so I don't have a lot of free time to actually play D&D. So it's hard to do a campaign diary for a campaign when you're only playing once a month. Granted, since the last time I believe we have had three or four sessions, so I think I've got enough to actually talk about in a new campaign diary video and my game should be back on schedule come next month, so hopefully these videos will start to become a more regular occurrence on the channel once again. And I guess for those of you who don't actually know what these videos are, basically this is just where I talk about my campaign, what's happening, and what my players are currently going through, and where we might be headed. And it's a lot less formal, I guess, than a lot of the other videos I do on this channel. It's not going to be edited down as much, there won't be as many flashy and exciting visuals. It's mostly going to be just me talking about my game, what's happening, and that's pretty much it. So enough wasting time though, let's get right into it. Uh, last we left off, the party had just made it to the front gates of Barum, if I'm not mistaken, or the Ringed City. It was a long and arduous journey and they had the corpses of two of their comrades with them, the ranger and the fighter from the party who had died and were killed by Dragoloths on the road on the way to Barum. So first order of business was I guess getting their caravan with all their horses and their giant cart that was filled with all of their goods and their friends bodies to somewhere where they could rest. So they made their way through the first of three walls in Barum, which was kind of the outside wall going into the outer city which is still a pretty populated area but it's the area of the town that's kind of like the lower class of society lives there. It's where all the common folk reside. Uh, one of the things about the city, the outside walls as well as about a quarter mile in all direction are completely scorched and blackened and this is because there is a pretty large fungal forest not too far away and the residents are constantly paranoid of that fungus encroaching on their farmlands and stuff within the walls. So that's part of the reason why these walls were literally built up as high as they were and they were constantly just burned off of any excess vegetation or anything within a quarter of a mile so that that fungus cannot spread into their town. So as the lower class part of this town, which is called the Granite District, is kind of the closest to the outside of wall, um, there's a lot of kind of that smell of just burning oil and smoke and that kind of thing just constantly blanketing this part of the city. And I guess I should talk about that too. The city is separated into many different districts. There's the Granite District, which is again kind of this lowly area of town where the common folk tend to live. There's the Jade District, which is predominantly populated by Goliaths, but we'll get into that in a little bit. There's the Steel District, which is close to the heart of town, which is where a lot of forges and weapons are created there. And there's also the Shale District, which is kind of just for the outskirts of town also, but it's more for where the mining and that kind of thing happens. Because this town, I guess it is like a perfectly round city, but it's up, it's up against a mountainside basically. So there's a mountain in the back and then kind of a ring of wall that goes around the outside. And I'm not sure if I mentioned this in the last video or not, but this city is predominantly dwarven. Surprise, they have giant walls and they're built next to a mountain. Who knew? Uh, there is a minority population of Goliaths who also live here, which, again, are relegated mostly to the Jade District. Not because they have to be or anything, but they just kind of do their own thing, and that's where they have very much preserved their own culture, is within this one specific district. The analogy I gave to my players was this is kind of like how if you go into New York City, there's like Chinatown, which is a separate thing. It's still part of the city, but you go there and things look and feel and smell very different than they would if you were to go down, say, 
Broadway or any of the other main streets in the city. So, Felden, being from Barum, had a connection here. Um, as part of his backstory, someone who he had lived with and who was a friend of his was an elderly blacksmith named Godo. So the party went to him and he basically showed up with all of his friends, two bodies, caravan, all these horses, and he was like, Hey buddy, we're gonna be here for like a week, is it cool if I crash and put all my stuff here? Awesome, thanks. And the grumpy old blacksmith wasn't necessarily stoked about that, but he was a friend of Felden's and was like, yeah sure, that, that's fine, like, you guys will, if you need a place to stay, you can stay here kind of thing. So that was fine, with the party taken care of and everyone fed, they made their way down to the Church of Moradin, which is kind of at the center of the Steel District, which is, again, where all the forging and stuff happens. So, it makes sense that they have a massive temple there erected to the god of the forge and the predominant dwarven deity. So once they were there, they spoke with the head priest of the temple and basically explained that they, A, wanted to try to bring these people back to life, but also they wanted to just try to communicate with them in some way to figure out what their spirits wanted to do, basically meaning what the players wanted them to do with their characters. Out of game, they knew that uh, the player of Karen's Ranger didn't want Karen to come back. She was already rolling up a new character. And the player of uh, Ren, the fighter, the tiefling fighter who was killed, did want Ren to come back. They, the players knew that, but just on an in-game level, I mean, when you look at it from the perspective of their characters, their characters had just lost two of their friends, so of course they would want to try to bring them back. So this was them essentially communing with the spirits of their deceased friends to figure out what those characters would want, and that's what the players would want. And also gave those fallen characters a way to kind of say goodbye or whatever. So they went to this church and they asked the cleric if he could cast Speak with Dead, which he could easily do. Now, of course, I didn't just say he cast Speak with Dead. What they did was he had some of his accolades kind of set up like a salt ring, and then he stood in the center of it and did some magic runes, lit some incense, that kind of thing. And essentially, his version of Speak with Dead was he allowed the spirit of this deceased person to possess his body, and then his eyes kind of rolled back, and that person then spoke through this cleric's mouth, basically. It was very interesting because we had two very distinct interactions here. So Karen, the ranger, who had passed on, um... She was ready to die, her player didn't want to bring her back to life and was moving on. So she kind of said her goodbyes to the party and had a little like one-on-one -on -one almost with every individual party member and it was pretty sweet. And um, essentially said that like she had fun adventuring with them, gave my stuff to my parents if you ever go back to Andrum, and said her goodbyes. Um, one kind of bit of lore that I allowed that character to throw in here if they wanted to, which they decided to mention, was that uh, her spirit had ended up on Elysium, which is like the chaotic good aligned plane. And in my world, in my cosmology, Elysium is what kind of lines the barrier between all of the lower planes and all of the upper planes. So as a faithful of Elowana, this ranger had basically been taken up her spirit was taken up with the Night Sisters of Elowana and was now responsible for essentially protecting the border from like demons and devils and stuff that were trying to come up into the higher planes. So she thought that was pretty cool and it kind of gave her character like some more purpose. They're not just dead, they're off doing this thing, that's fine. And when that player told me like they didn't want to try to bring that character back to life, I was like, okay, well that character is mine now, like she's an NPC um, and this is what she's doing. So she passed some of that information along to the party, and I also told her that the planes, like the outer planes, are kind of in a state of chaos right now. And now the party knows, because Felden knows, that Paylor was killed. Um, and that's why everything is just an absolute chaos, because you have all these powerful demons and archdevils and stuff who are using this as an opportunity to try to like gain some footing and gain some power, right? So Karen was explaining that this is the situation, like on the outer planes things are kind of in chaos right now. So the, that's just kind of seeding some maybe future plot hooks, but we'll get into that more as we go through this video. Um, and that was fine, so that was great. She went back to do whatever her spirit was doing. And then it came time for Ren, who was the tiefling fighter. And the party was eager to speak with him to see what he was gonna say because they all knew that Ren did in fact want to come back to life. Of course, their characters didn't know this, but the players knew this because, again, the other player had told them, yeah, resurrect me, I want to keep playing this character. So, Ren coming back was a very different dialogue. In this world, when these two characters had died, 
they kind of passed on, met the ferryman, and then were taken to wherever they wanted to go. Ren refused to get on the ferry boat on the River Styx, essentially. He was like, no, I'm just going to sit on the end of this wharf and basically threw a tantrum like a child saying he refused to acknowledge that he had been killed, which was pretty funny. Um, so then when the party was asking him, like, hey, what's going on with you? Like, we're going to try to bring you back if we can. He was very much like, yeah, what are you guys doing talking to me? Obviously, I want to come back to life. Like, come on, let's get to it. And he's like, wait, am I in someone's body right now? And kind of looked around. And then he tried to, like, walk forward. He's like, oh, let's go to the bar or whatever and tried to leave the church. And then this is where that salt circle comes in, because I said as soon as he kind of went up against the salt circle and put his hand over that threshold, I said his spirit kind of started to burn and it caused pain, and he was being pushed back into the middle of the circle. And this was when the party kind of realized, yeah, it wasn't this cleric's first time doing a speak with dead spell for a bunch of asshole adventurers. So that was kind of what ended up happening there, which is a neat little detail. It was just a funny bit of roleplay because he was like, oh, I guess it's not going to be that easy. I can't just take over this old dwarf's body and go about my day. Because that was another thing that I wanted to kind of make a point of, is I feel like anytime you're interacting with the metaphysical or spirits or ghosts or whatever it is, even in D&D, there should be this element of danger to it. Like, it's not like there was this was necessarily a very malicious spell where they wouldn't have been able to do too much, but just that the priest took those precautions because he's seen what has happened before. And to save himself the exorcism later, he kind of... He knew what to expect. And I just think that adds an element of groundedness to it. It can make it interesting when you add those elements of things that you wouldn't necessarily think of at a glance, but then when you actually do it and your players go, oh yeah, that makes sense, then it's it's a good feeling for sure. So that was fine. Uh, they ended the spell. Ren went back to sitting on the end of the wharf like a child, and the rest of the party was then talking to the priest like, okay, so what do we do? If he wants to come back to life, how can we resurrect him? My setting is not what I would call low magic, but the magic that exists is rare and usually quite powerful. So a resurrection spell, to actually be able to bring someone back to life who's been dead for like days, um, he, the priest couldn't just do that. It's not like, oh, give me 500 gold and I'll do it for you. Um, but he gave them a clue. He said that some of his paladins, who were the Hammers of Morden that were out doing some kind of mission, came across some kind of powerful divine magic signal at a temple that was located out in the desert and that that might be a lead on possibly resurrecting this person or they also knew for a fact that there was a similar signal that was coming from the fungal forest and that they had heard rumors that there was some kind of plant growing there that they might be able to use to bring someone back to life. So basically the party had two options or I guess three options really they could just not bring that character back to life they could go out to this temple in the desert, investigate that, or they could make their way into the fungal forest and investigate that. Ultimately, they decided on the desert temple as it seemed more promising as it was directly a religious thing and not just a random plant possibly in the jungle, which was fine. I had minor plans laid out for both of those adventures and then figured I would flush out on those things more depending on which option they chose. But uh, they went for the temple, which was fine. So by the time we got to that point, after one or two sessions later, I had that fully prepared. So in the meantime, they were like, well, we're in Baron, we're in this huge city. What is there to do? And they looked towards Felden and Mona, who were the two people that are actually from this city. And Felden wasn't much of a party. Everybody knows of Cinder's Block, of course, which is this giant bar in the Granite District, which is called Cinder's Block because it is owned by a, I can't remember their first name, but her last name was Cinder Flame, and it occupies an entire city block, hence Cinder's Block. And Mona was all for that because she had connections with the Thieves Guild that was operating out of Cinder's Block, so she decided that that was great and they were gonna make their way there. So Cinder's Block is essentially a three-tier tavern slash gambling hall slash inn slash whatever you really need it to be. Uh, the main floor was just kind of set up as this really large bar and drinking area, tons of dwarves in there drinking away, as you would expect in a giant dwarven town. Uh, also a few goliaths, of course, here and there. And then the top floor of this establishment is a gambling hall. So you go up there and again, of course, there's a small bar up there, but there's a lot of gambling happening and different games and that kind of thing. And then the bottom floor, which is in the basement, is actually like a pit fighting arena, kind of like a uh, like a UFC arena almost underneath the bar. 
So, of course, as party members are ought to do, they went in engaging in all manners of debauchery. They got really drunk. They went upstairs. They played a bunch of different card games and different kinds of gambling, I guess. And a bunch of them, I, I came up with a couple of them on my own. A couple of them I took from um, Matt Mercer, actually, because he has, I can't remember where this is, but he made a Twitter post like a long time ago about the gambling games he uses in Critical Role. So I took... Um, I can't remember exactly what they're called now, but one of them is essentially poker, but simplified to be using dice. And another one is like a lizard racing game. So you put a bunch of lizards down on like a racetrack on this big table and they race around and you bet on like which lizard you think is going to win and stuff, which is pretty cool. Um, so that was fine. They, some of them won some money, some of them lost some money. And this was when they got to what the group is affectionately referred to as being Pulp Fiction. Which was, they went downstairs and there was a big title match that was going to be happening. It was supposed to be this very powerful Goliath warrior going up against a, another equally powerful Dwarven warrior. So they were all going down to watch the fight and there was some betting happening and that kind of thing. And Mona was connecting with her Thieves Guild pals. And um, she basically was talking to them asking them you know what's going on with this fight and everything just getting information about what was happening that night like you would in a normal conversation and um her contact with the thieves guild basically gave her a little wink wink nudge nudge that like hey if you're smart bet all of your money against the goliath because he's gonna go down and he was the one who was favored to win so they were like she's like oh okay sure my contact's telling me this like the goliath's gonna throw the fight so she goes downstairs and kind of convinces the rest of the party and tells them like one at a time you know like you should bet against the goliath um you might stand to win some money and the paladin who <laughs> itself proclaimed never bets bet like 400 gold or something against the goliath which was fine um because he figured out oh, if this guy's definitely gonna win then i'll make some money and that's fine because it was like three to one odds so everyone was gonna win some money and of course, I mean, I actually did roll for it just to see how the fight would turn out, but the Goliath, in fact, did not throw the fight. And um, I guess to get more into detail here, what happened was they were fighting, the Goliath went down, and the dwarf taunted him. So in, my, in this world, I have very much modeled the Goliath culture after feudal Japan in a lot of ways. So this world has Goliath samurais walking around. They're main protective force are samurais and they have a shogun like that's the system of order that they follow and there's several cultural similarities just in the way that i have presented them to make them stand out and be a little bit more unique than just big stone guys basically so he had this really intricate like back tattoo of his clan's um symbol and which is a burning lotus and when he was called out on that by the dwarf basically he taunted him and said something about his clan being weak or something to that effect and then the goliath stood up and kind of in a moment of pride um fought back very hard and <laughs> ended up actually scoring a critical hit and he killed the dwarf who he was fighting and then ran out through the back entrance like just as quickly as he had come in so everyone lost a bunch of money the thieves guild is upset now they're after this guy who was supposed to throw the fight and didn't hold up his end of the bargain the party is also upset um it was felt in the paladin was like you know this is what i get for indulging in my vices and gambling i should have known like this is my punishment essentially which i thought was good role play um so yeah they were not very ups they were not very happy about that and the monk um beaten hater went outside to see if he could catch up with this guy but by the time he got out there he was long gone because this uh, goliath is also a monk he's actually a way of the kensei monk if we want to get specifically into that but again kind of getting a little ahead of ourselves um yeah, so that was their night there. They had a great time. They ended up losing some money, um, but that was fine. Also, I guess one thing I should mention on the way out, Mona thought she was going to make some of that money back, or she thought she could at least try, by uh, going up to this very rich tiefling patron at the bar, and she was going to try to pickpocket him, and while looking through his purse, she realized he had, like, a hundred diamonds in his bag, which is insane. It's just an insane amount of money. Um, and she was going to try to steal some, and she got caught by this guy trying to steal some who didn't actually get her in trouble too much but just kind of scolded her and was like what do you think you're doing and sent her on her way but uh, that will be important later and we'll, we'll get to that again as well i'm getting out of myself here so the next day the party uh 
they wake up and they decide they're going to go to the Jade District to investigate and see what they can learn about this guy who was supposed to throw this fight and didn't and see what's happening with that. And um, they had another reason for going to the Jade District too. I'm not sure exactly what it was now, but uh, that was that was part of the reason why. I think they just wanted to go there because they heard they might be able to sell them certain types of weapons like katanas and stuff which no one in the party can actually use because it's an exotic weapon but they just wanted to check it out. So upon actually getting to the Jade District, um, things were kind of weirdly quiet and they ended up finding a large crowd that was gathered around what turned out to be a public execution. Uh, it looked like there was one samurai fellow who was being executed by another and everyone was just kind of there watching that. So that happened after this execution went down, they kind of asked around, talked to some people, talked to the guy who did the execution himself, and long story short, they ended up finding out that this individual who was executed was executed for running from battle and basically cowardice. Um, and the reason that he ran, apparently, he was supposed to be escorting a caravan from... Um, Barum to Andrum, which is across the desert, so it was him and like four other Goliath Samurais as well as a sand giant. They're supposed to be escorting a haul of precious metals and gems. Specifically for them, it was a giant cartload of diamonds, like a whole lot of them. And apparently they were attacked, and he said it was by a single individual who was also a Goliath Samurai named Lord Soth. And if that name sounds familiar, it's probably because you've read Dragonlance and those two characters don't really share a whole lot of similarity. I basically just stole the name because I thought it sounded cool. Well, I shouldn't say they have no similarities. They are both Death Knights, except one of them, the one in this world, happens to be a Goliath Samurai Death Knight, whereas the other is just a normal Death Knight. I'm pretty sure he's like the Death Knight if you actually look at the artwork from the Monster Manual. So he basically came back and said that they were attacked by Lord Soth, who is this samurai shogun who's been dead for like 600 years. Like no one's seen or heard from him. Um, and there's a lot of history with that character in this world and how he was kind of responsible for the downfall of the Goliath Empire in a way, but just out of his own arrogance and lust for power. But he's been dead for like 500 years, so no one's heard from him. And this guy came back running saying that they were attacked by this person and that's why he ran. So the party finds this intriguing because they did in fact have an encounter with an undead samurai fellow who was riding a dinosaur in the desert um, quite some time ago at this point, but uh, who bore the symbol of the Neros clan, which is the clan that Lord Soth happens to be from. So they're kind of corroborating the story and thinking, you know, maybe this guy's telling the truth. Uh, they didn't actually fight him, but they simply saw him, they ran into him basically, and that was that. So the party also finds out that this character who got in this fight last night and was supposed to throw it but didn't is named Uran, and he is also from this Neros clan and that he apparently skipped town. No one's seen him since yesterday. Uh, when they did go to his house, it was ransacked, of course, by the Thieves Guild, presumably, and uh, there was no trace of him. So they spent quite some time investigating and talking to lots of people to find out all they could about this Lord Soth character and his background and what's going on there. Another piece of important information actually came from one of the master swordsmiths at the Katana Forge, which sounds like a big place, but it's basically just a dude's small house, essentially, where he mills this katana steel and, um, and makes swords for people who are willing to pay for them. And... Um, and talking with him, they heard that this Lord Soth character apparently wields a sword called Black Razor, which is one of the six dragon's teeth. At least in my world it is. Now again, for those of you who might be familiar with that name, Black Razor is a real weapon in the Dungeon Master's Guide. My version of Black Razor is much different. It is a katana, and it does not do the exact same thing that you will find in the DMG. It is much more powerful. It has a lot of different abilities, which I can get into more in a separate video, but... Essentially, it allows the user control over life and death, it absorbs the souls of people it kills. Whenever it's drawn, someone has to die within an hour, it's either going to be the wielder or someone that they kill. And the more attuned to it, and there's like five or six different rituals you have to undergo to fully attune to this weapon, the more attuned to it you become, the more of its power it grants the wielder, thus allowing you to do more and more powerful things. But of course there is a price for that, meaning that every time it's drawn you have to kill more and more people and more frequently. So the party finds out about this and they decide there's not really a whole lot they can do, but they're starting to kind of put the pieces together of some kind of 
story happening in the back of their minds, but their main focus right now is still going to this temple and getting the means to revive their fallen comrade. So at this point we've had almost two sessions of complete roleplay, there hasn't been really any combat yet, which is honestly fine, it's funny how that happens sometimes, but um, yeah, the party has decided that they're going to hit the road, or the desert as it were, because there's not much of a road there. But they're going to start heading out towards this temple, which has been conveniently marked on their map roughly where it is by the priest at the Temple of Morden. So they set out on their way, and um, they actually had a couple of random encounters, nothing too crazy. One of them, I think, was just a group of merchants, and the other one ended up being a group of orcs. But fortunately, because of everything that went down with the orcs in the past, they happened to be from a clan of orcs that knew of them. So it wasn't so much a scary encounter. It was like, oh, hey, guys, how's it going? And they sat around shared camp with these orcs for the evening and went their separate ways the next day until eventually it took them about a week's travel in game and they made it to uh this massive temple that was at the center of kind of an ancient forgotten city and for those of you who are familiar with what this is this temple actually was the module the hidden shrine of tomoa chan or tomoakan or however you are supposed to pronounce that i think it's tomoa khan but don't quote me on that anyways they made their way through this town and the introduction to this module is fantastic because part, the party's basically making their way to the temple steps and as they're walking through this kind of craggy and broken up city street the whole thing just collapses and they fall into this immense pit that's like hundreds of feet below them so they end up in the basement of these ancient ruins and of course i'm not running this module just as it is i essentially stole the layout and some of the traps and encounters but this temple has a lot more secrets and a lot more going on with it than simply vampires like you would find in the original module. And one of the first things they see in this room are all these murals kind of along the wall in different scenes depicting different parts of life, as well as one scene specifically that they correctly assume was their version of the creation myth for whatever society resided in this town and worshipped at this temple. And this myth depicts all these figures doing different things, different ceremonies, as well as what appears to be these four godlike figures and these two other major godlike figures that are kind of battling it out. And in the background of it all is a very thinly veiled silhouette of a six-armed creature, its arms kind of extending around the entire mural. And that is where I think I'm going to leave it for this video. Uh, we're already starting to get on the long side a little bit here, and I want to have something to talk about in the next one. so. I think we'll cut it off here for now, and when we come back to this, we will discover what the party found in this temple, what mysteries they came across, and how and if they made their way out of here. So thank you guys so much for watching, I do appreciate it. If you like these videos, please let me know because I am happy to keep doing them as long as you guys are enjoying the content. And if you'd like to know more about this campaign specifically, just ask away, I'm happy to answer any questions you may or may not have. Anyways, thank you so much guys, I will see you in the next video, till then.